Hello, I am Highlands County Sheriff Paul Blackman. I am here today to deliver an update on the deputy involved shooting that took place on the morning of Sunday, January 19th, 2020 at 9207 Bridal Path in Sebring. When a Highlands County Sheriff's Office deputy or deputies are involved in a shooting, our policy is for the investigation to be handled by an independent agency. Therefore, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement is conducting this investigation. This is done to ensure an abundance of transparency. I am giving you this report because you have the right to know what took place that day and also to correct some false statements that have been made on social media by people with zero firsthand knowledge of the actual events. The following summary of the events of that morning is taken from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement's initial interviews of the deputies involved as well as the domestic violence victim that was in the room at the time of the shooting. While this report is preliminary, we believe it is an accurate accounting of what took place. On Sunday, January 19th at 4.48 a.m., a 911 call was made to the Consolidated Dispatch Center. The full call is five minutes and 15 seconds long, so we will play you the most important parts of the call now. 911, where is your emergency? Uh, let me give you the address that we suspect that there is a problem. 9207 Bridal Pass Road. So wh what do you think is going on? Okay. Um, Justin Nealis. And one of his friends called me and said that there was a domestic disturbance at his house. So, so when you say domestic disturbance, what do you, what do you mean? There is a female in the house. Uh -huh. He has hurt her. He's hit her, and we don't know what her condition is. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he has a gun or not. I think he's probably high on drugs. Okay. Are you able to get a hold of Dustin at all? No, I I haven't tried. I I didn't want to call because the neighbor is afraid that if he sees the police come in. She was afraid to call the police and I told her we had to call the police. When deputies arrived in the area at 5.10 a.m., they were met by the person who witnessed the beginning of the domestic dispute between Dustin Nealis and his girlfriend. According to the statements from both the witness and the victim, Nealis had attacked the victim physically, hitting her both with his fists and a handheld vacuum cleaner to the point where the victim said she almost lost consciousness. He then pulled her into the master bedroom of the home and locked them in both inside as the victim screamed for help. Nealis's criminal history includes multiple misdemeanor and felony arrests. Many of his offenses involved violence and he had a history of using weapons when he became angry. The witness told the deputies they needed to make sure they had enough deputies before they approached the house. Yeah, the complaint thinks we need an army. That's just not here, not a very good fix, and more eyes would be nice. I don't think stuff that like cops. Deputies used a satellite image of the home to develop an approach strategy, ultimately approaching the home from the south side. One of the deputies carried a shotgun loaded with less lethal bing bag rounds. The deputies had been provided a key to the home and reached the front door at approximately 5.37 a.m. At that time, they unlocked the front door, announced they were with the sheriff's office, and told Nealis he needed to come outside. He responded by saying he had a hostage. Deputies could hear a female voice, later identified as the hostage, screaming from within the residence. Three deputies entered the home while two others remained outside to establish a perimeter. Deputies had to breach a locked pocket door to reach the area of the bedroom door.
They again called for Neelis to come out. He responded by saying he had a knife and he was going to kill his hostage, who could still be heard screaming for help. At that point, deputies felt they had no choice but to enter the bedroom in order to save the life of the hostage. They forced their way through the bedroom door and fanned out inside the bedroom. Neelis and the victim were positioned on the bed with Neelis holding the female hostage in front of him as if using her as a shield. He had his left arm wrapped around her body and his right hand held a box cutter that was pressed to the victim's throat. The female victim was fighting for her life, attempting to push Neelis's arm away from her. Deputies ordered Neelis to drop the knife and show his hands multiple times, but he refused. A beanbag round was fired from the less lethal shotgun, striking Neelis on his upper thigh, but had zero effect. It was at this point, at approximately 5.41 a.m., that three shots were fired. All three struck Neelis, who was killed instantly. Bravo 2 dispatch. We got shots fired with the EMS. The victim, who had sustained multiple injuries inflicted by Neelis, including bruises and scratches and a cut to her hand from the box cutter, was immediately removed from the room by the deputies. She later told investigators that Neelis had said he was going to kill her and she believed he would have if deputies had not intervened. Anytime someone loses their life, it is a tragedy. This is no different. It is a tragedy for the family and the friends of Mr. Neelis, as well as the deputies involved. I wish that this situation could have had a peaceful end, but the deputies were left with no choice other than to use deadly force in order to save the life of a hostage. They did that without hesitation, and I am very proud of them for that immediate action. As is our normal procedure, we have provided those members directly involved with the shooting an opportunity for mental health counseling and will continue to support them during this time. The members who were responsible for actually shooting Mr. Neelis have been required to attend critical incident stress debriefings with our contracted forensic psychiatrist. This will need to be completed prior to the members being allowed to return to work. After that, those members are cleared to return to work whenever they feel they are ready to do so. We will not be releasing the names of the deputies until the Florida Department of Law Enforcement has completed their investigation. Although the Florida Department of Law Enforcement is still waiting lab results regarding ballistic and toxicology reports, we feel these results will not have any bearing on the results of the case. I would like to thank the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for their immediate response, very thorough investigation, and continued support. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to bring you up to speed on the events of that day and what the preliminary investigation has revealed to this point. I hope I have been able to answer any questions you may have had about the incident, and I sincerely hope this is the last time I have to give you an update on a shooting involving one of our deputies.